Hello everyone, welcome to Not a Space for Hey. We're here with a special guest, so uh, we have an interesting program. We're going to talk about racism. My name is Alfonso Villacorta, and we're here with Ben. And we're going to be talking about racism in workplaces and school and um, what we can do to stop it. We also are in it with Lorena. Hi guys. <laughs> so we're happy, we really hope you enjoy. This is an important topic, so uh, let's start with you, Ben. Would you like to share an experience you have? Yeah. In my school, there's a lot of casual racism. So people people might not even realize they're being racist. <laughs> and like, for example, people go around saying the N-word. And um, because in my area, it's such um, ethnicity is, is just majority white people. It's 95.2% white people. Um, they are targeting the minorities and they're being racist. And I think it's an awful thing that we need to educate them from a young age. Yeah, and did you um, see any specific case of writing things at your school? Um, I did one time, my uh, someone in my class messaged someone on Instagram, cyberbully, mm -hmm. called them the M-word, and they, they got a detention for that. But I, I don't think a detention is enough for cyberbullying so on with racism. I think they needed a, a more hot. Yeah, do you think like people from your school uh, would be like open to learn about like choosing anti-racism? Um, I think maybe because uh, at 16, our brain is more developed than let's say a six-year-old teacher starts school, but uh, they're less likely to change their mind and think in a different way. So I think educating children, like people from a young age, is very important so they get it in their head immediately. So they, they can't be racist, whether it's a joke or it's direct racism, or, or even if you, you don't think you're being racist, you need to educate people so they know they are being racist. Have you seen this kind of protest only in your grade, or have you seen this in all the school? I've seen it in other schools, I've seen it in all boys schools, all girls schools, mixed schools, public schools, grammar schools, it happens everywhere. And I think the fact that people are saying it means that they're persuaded by maybe their family or friends older than them, because people who are older have a, a big influence on younger people. And I think um, the, the fact that they now say it, they're going to pass it on to maybe, maybe when they're older, their kids or maybe younger cousins or friends they have, they're younger, and the cycle's going to repeat where they're going to say it, you know, the people below them are going to say it, people below them are going to say it, which is why it's so widespread. Okay, uh, in your, at your school, they made any campaign or programs to try to avoid this problem? They have done a couple of assemblies, and I think because in my school it's mainly like individual interpersonal racism, mm -hmm. so it's all, you know, one person to another person or a small group to another, like a single person or a small group targeting them. I think the fact they've done an assembly for maybe 200 people just isn't going to do anything because the people who are actually racist and the ones who aren't going to be listening. So for example, me and my friends are racist and we would have been sat there listening. But for us, it's not as important because we didn't say the stuff that they say. And the fact that they're not going to be listening because they're going to be bored or they're not going to care. They'll just think, oh, my, my friends do it, my family does it, it's fine. I think we need to connect them, connect to them on a more individual, personal level. So they realize what they're doing is wrong, but the thing, we don't have any lunchtime groups, we don't have any after school groups, and I think that'll be important. So I think maybe when I get back to school, I could do an assembly for the school, and I'd focus more on individual racism, which is what I see most. So obviously I'll mention the other types, but I'll, I'll like, focus on individual racism and why it's wrong. Thank you, Ben, for sharing that story. Yeah, uh, for us, it would be the last uh, question. If you could have the chance to be the principal at your school, what actions would you like to do to avoid this uh, racism? Well, I'd definitely make a group at lunchtime. Again, I love to school, like anti-racism. And if I catch on being racist, I would make it necessary that they go to it. So I, I'd need it open for everyone. But if I catch on being racist or they get told off, they will need to have to be put into it. 
And depending on how it is, we'll, we'll, we'll put them into it for a specific amount of time. If they keep doing it, they'll do it longer. And I think also the, like the assembly I talked about, focusing on the racism that I see most around my area and how it's, it's, it's really wrong to bully minorities, whether it's race or sexuality or, or anything like that. So I'll focus on points that help people realize and I'll talk about, I'll talk about them not doing in front of younger children because that's going to influence them and then and the, it's going to keep carrying on, which is an awful thing. Yeah, thank you Ben for sharing. I think this is an important topic um, in the, at schools because there was, uh, there's the place, there is the place uh, where our children are boy and they, we, we think that they are learning like values and, um, and different courses, but actually also happen these kind of problems, uh, related to rape and bullying there. So, um, thank you for sharing. I think, uh, your participate, your participation is very important. Um, what about you, Lorena? So, yeah, so obviously I, I, I'm from Serbia, but I was born in, in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. And, you know, in the Balkans, we only have like one race. So there are only white people in he there. I mean, majority of them. Uh, but I have a story of like when I experienced uh, something that I didn't expect. So um, in my school in Bosnia, we have a one exchange program uh, with people, with, you know, children from uh, Albania and Serbia, Serbians and Albanians have a conflict. It's like more political, but you know, we have a lot of uh, prejudice, um, you know, towards people from Albania. But when we had this exchange, of course, young people came to, to my city and I was so surprised that they were so good, such nice people. They were no, nothing like um, they are shown on in media or like, you know, um, and I was so surprised like how uh, we are actually all the same. There were no discrimination towards any of us and it was such a good experience and I didn't expect uh, it to be. Yeah, I think that usually happy when we have uh, an idea before knowing a person, right? Do you, do you think that that would be the case? Yeah, we like made uh, we make ideas in our head, hands and like we really think that like they are different they are like not just person that they actually are i think um the maybe the media you know the television 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 news uh are responsible for creating these ideas yes but you know television television and all the media puts uh you know the wars the you know political and they um, they actually uh, don't really show the real people who are living there, like, uh, or especially youth. I think youth from all over the world is the same. Is their uh, their majority a good people? They're really like, from what I saw, they're uh, all this Gen Z. We are all smart, good people. So I don't think there is any like there has to be any you know uh, beef uh, around them. Have you ever seen uh, any like a specific situation with Albanian Albanian people? Well, of course, you know uh, the problem with you know Kosovo and everything. Uh, but now that I, I actually still have friends from you know Albania, I sometimes chat with them, and yeah. Yeah, how complicated sometimes is like uh, like receiving these messages from media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, very hard sometimes because we prejudge uh, people before knowing them. Yeah, I was actually like, scared, like, oh my God, they're coming here, what, you know? And, but when, when you meet them, yeah, it, everything, yeah, everything goes away. Like, oh my God, it's just a normal person. They're just, you know, just like us. That kind of situation actually happened in a uh, all around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to tell you my experience of, I live in Peru, and um, I'm in South America, there is a country where is, uh, there is a crisis in Venezuela. So uh, Venezuelan people just migrate to any other countries in, in South America, such as Colombia, Peru, Chile. And um, sometimes um, we heard in television that there are like um, robbers uh, from Venezuela and just 
that is the main part of of of, of rubbing Edo, which is wrong definitely because um it's not just venezuelan people it's a, a, a problem related to all the society all the previous society um but we create that concept in our minds so we are like growing up with that mindset children are growing up with that mindset with that idea about the Venezuelan people and it's wrong because i meant the Venezuelan people and they are lovely persons yes. but of course as a peruvian colombian Venezuelan, there are some them that yeah maybe they uh, commit this kind of uh, actions you know against the law but we cannot like um, make a general idea to judge them right because it's not fair yeah. not fair for them not fair for us not fair for any uh, nationality not just in south america for also but also in, in europe oh. and so yes so i'm happy you share with me this this experience uh we're going to have uh some um a special guest but after the commercial so thank you for me here we'll wait you in the next um in the next part of the program please don't move so thank you hello everyone we're back thank you for being here with us we were sharing some experiences related to the racism um as i told you we have two special guests so i'm here with mickey and eliza mickey hello good time here hello new we were talking about racism and uh, how important it's like to talk about these kind of topics for our society. Um, ben was saying uh, some uh, experiences related to the school. Uh, Lorena was saying some experiences related to Albanian people. And I was saying some experience related to Venezuelan people in South America. So, um, guys, do uh, you have any experience related to racism? Would you like to start, Ms. Miki? Uh... Me personally, no. Uh, however, I've witnessed it because we come from quite predominantly white area. I think the statistic is uh, ninety-five point six percent white uh, people. And uh, however, like there, I've witnessed a couple instances of racism. Uh, for instance, uh, we in our in my school, I was there for about seven years, and I think I saw about four people of color go through that in school. Mm -hmm. And one of them was quite a good friend of mine when I was thirteen. And and he was chosen, so our school wanted to seem really diverse and everything. However, we only had about four people of color. So what they would do is they would grab people from the grab the people of color from their class and shove them into photos for like the, the debate team, for the football team, and everything, just to show that they're diverse. And one of the best photos that I think's been taken down now is of the rugby team. My friend is quite a scrawny guy, quite a small guy, and he's in this photo with these massive people. So the photos went like bang, 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 drops down to him because he's just in the center and goes back up. But like, no, the, the, aside from that, like we, we were called in names and stuff because the area that we lived in was quite rural and they had a lot of people around the area had their fixed views. So there was a couple incidences that I saw personally and a couple of stood up against where people from the older year were making comments about him passing by and everything. I can't say about the other, pe other people of color in the school, but for him, he definitely suffered in that school, unfortunately. Yeah. The school, like, did anything about, uh, you know, the fighting against racism? Did you have any, um, let's say, presentation? So, in our school, uh, once a week, uh, we did this thing called citizenship, which is, like, talks about, like, general stuff, like, let's say, drug abuse, uh, sexism, and yes, we did talk about racism, but not into the depth that we should have at the time. Because once a week, and it was a very wide topic, it'd be like an hour on racism, and that, and that was it for the entire year. And there was no other guidance to it. There's no proper uh, education about racism, anti-racism techniques. Yeah. You do think like, um, you know, people from your school would actually listen to the... Uh, these presentations or anything like classes like that, do you think there will be like uh, involved? No, no, I, like the, these, these like periods, this, the, like the hour was kind of like a goof. The teachers didn't even give one about it. Like it was literally just a presentation on what not to do. Like don't call people names and everything. And that was it. There were little like techniques of trying to be an ally, or anything like that. Okay. Oh, thank you for sharing, Keith. It was uh, like, it's good to know these kind of cases. 
Elisa, Lennon. with you, um, would you like to share an experience? Yeah, so I worked as a teacher in a preschool um, in the United Kingdom. So the school that I worked in was ages one to five. Um, the area that I worked in was a incredibly privileged area. Um, you know, we had kids that would come in, be three years old, and be like, what did you do for your weekend? Oh, I just went to Dubai. Um, but we had one one child who was from Chile and he faced definitely a different treatment from the other children from the other preschool teachers because they themselves, they were white, they were privileged, they were wealthy. You know, they were one of the same with the other children in the class. And he definitely faced completely different treatment because he wasn't. So the teachers would make comments behind his back to us and they'd say in a very jokey way, a very casual way. Um, so it was kind of hidden racism. Um, and he was treated as this completely naughty, naughty child. So he suffered from like behavioral difficulties slightly, you know, you wouldn't call him a naughty child at all, but we would go in to have reading time, let's say, you know, and they would make this huge effort and this huge deal of putting him on like this like rug that they have for him and they would really single him out and they'd sit him on this rug and they'd single him out and instead of putting him on this because that is it is used when you're dealing with children that suffer from behavioral issues because it keeps them in one area in one space and stops them kind of fidgeting and helps them kind of focus however when they did it they would make a really big scene out of it specifically and I think what you saw, because he was targeted by the teachers, you saw the other children learn from that and they started treating him as the naughty child. And I think you don't, you're not born as a racist, you know? You don't, these children haven't, they don't have these opinions themselves. They're, psychologically, their brain is still learning, they're copying, they're learning from their parents. They're learning from their siblings, they're learning from the other teachers in the school. And, you know, because they saw him being treated differently, you then saw this emerging pattern of them treating him differently. I think really that just shows the basics of where it all comes from. It's something that is so systematically in place that has happened hundreds and thousands of years ago, you know, since we were created. That people are racist and people have racist attitudes and opinions. And because of that, it is just continued. and. We don't, we don't want racism, we, we don't want to be teaching our younger generation that. And yet we still are, it's happening from one years old, one years old, they're in the school and they're witnessing that and they're being taught that that is acceptable. Teachers are meant to be role models and... Yeah. So as we, as adults, change our behaviour, we will definitely invest on younger people, on even babies. Yeah, no, 100%. We, we have a duty, I think. Um, especially as all of us are in youth organisations and all of us work with children, I think we need to be so mindful of who we are as people. And if we let one comment slide, if we let one racist joke slide, if we witness something and we don't step in, then how are we expecting the future generation themselves to make a change? Um, so I've always, I've always really been like an advocate of you know, sticking up to people and I'm one that will always share my opinion on something. And I think you do see that. You know, my younger brother um, has now started following in suit and telling people off for using racial slurs and telling people off for using racist language. And I do see that as because, well, you learned from me. What do you think? Not the last thing. You think you've, because you've seen it from, well, no, because you are, you have been the youth and you've witnessed that. Do you think, you know, I, was, I flipped the interview around here, but well, <laughs> yeah, obviously if you, I didn't see you doing that, I wouldn't have done anything. Yeah. Because I would have been, I would have been too nervous to, I feel like it did, there would have been no point. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's crucial, isn't it? You need to educate the youth because they're, they're the future. They are the future. They are the ones who are going to shape the world as as it goes on. And so it's very important that we need to get rid of these stigmas and these uh, beliefs uh, of, of differences and everything we need to get rid of. Yeah, yeah and, and as I would say, it's something important. People are influenced, you know, but 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 others, uh, and before commercials, 
uh, we were talking about media, how important is media, what is the message that they gave to us, right? And because they uh, share an idea and that the idea comes into our minds. So uh, that could be a really good idea or maybe a negative one. So um, that is very important to, to talk about, about the media and what's the message they're sharing. Um, but that, yeah, what you said, guys, thank you for sharing. Thank you, uh, and to, yeah. Uh, I would like to finish with this uh, question because it shows we were talking about the problems we have, but we also want to know about the allies. What is an ally and what is, why this uh, concept is very important to all people who are watching this, um, for also for, for people who were affected by, by racism and so on. I think both of them, you need to be kind and you need to be supportive and you need to be someone that you can lean on you know an ally has to be you know everyone we all have to if we see something and we see any injustice it may be racial maybe homophobia maybe sexism you step in you say something you challenge it you cause a conversation you cause an argument um, and obviously i think it's really important as well that there are a lot of times when to be an ally to challenge someone could be harmful to you. It could be putting you in an unsafe position or it could be doing something that you yourself don't feel comfortable with. Um, I think it's really important to kind of touch on the fact that you don't have to go up to someone and go, Oi, you know, stop it. You can you go off, check on the person. You can go get someone else, notify someone else. You can, there are so many, there's like a multitude of ways that you're able to be an ally. And it just stems down to support, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if there is, uh, if there are people who were affected by racism, Mickey, why would you tell them? I think like, when you're dealing with any racist matter, you have to be very smart with the way you handle it. Is because if, if you see someone being racist and you dive in head first without thinking about it, you can escalate the situation which then is no good for anyone because you now have two people who are very, very angry and that could lead, lead to some awful stuff. Like, I've known situations where someone's dealt, dealt, in, dealt with it aggressively and people got very hurt, police have been called and it you have to be very smart with the way you do it. So it's the what you want to do is you want to make sure the, the victim of it is okay and you want to de-escalate the situation so you can you can remove the the victim console them make sure they're okay or you can educate the abuser you, you can stand up for them and be like no you can't say that so then it shows some form of solidarity that you're on the victim's side you're defending them but at the same time you're making sure they're okay because you want to make sure that pe they they know that pe people are on their side and that we don't agree with the stuff that people are saying yeah you're right uh, thank you guys for being here, guys. Thank you. No problem. Man. Thank you also, Loriana. And Ben, uh, we really hope you enjoyed this program. And uh, we hope to see you next time. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, you. See you. Thank you.